Lord Lexton. I beg leave to ask the question standing in my name on the order paper. My Lords, the Government agrees with the report's main conclusions and continues to take steps to ensure that statutory instruments respect parliamentary processes and conventions, are drafted to a high standard and remain accessible to anyone at any time. The Committee made one specific recommendation on the free issue procedure and the Leader of the House of Commons continues to liaise with the National Archives to take that forward. Diverting briefly from my uh, uh, campaign for justice for Sir Edward Heath, I put down this uh, question to draw attention to the work of the Joint Committee of Statutory Instruments, of which I'm a member, and to the expertise of our quite excellent lawyers who go through every, in, uh, every instrument uh, line by line, indeed word by word. The Committee has become increasingly concerned recently about the number of drafting mistakes being made by uh, departments. Could I ask my no noble friend to pursue that issue? Uh, in the report, which is referred to in the uh, question, um, stress is laid on the importance of avoiding delays in publishing instruments and laying them before uh, Parliament. Uh, will ministers impress upon departments uh, the, the need to ensure that delays do not occur? Uh, can I pay tribute to my noble friend and those who with him work on the JCSI and indeed the lawyers? for their important, if unglamorous, work in scrutinising subordinate legislation, uh, not least because their work rate has had to increase substantially because of the increased flow of SIs. Uh, turning to his specific uh, uh, points, on um, corrections and, and errors, the, the Government has laid more than 1,500 SIs in the session to date, not all related to Brexit. And as of a recent report, the Committee had, for one reason or another, reported on 136 of them. <coughs> In nearly three quarters of those cases, the Government either made a correction, provided further information or gave an undertaking to do so. On the issue of delays, of the 582 SIs considered by the Committee since its report in June last year, only one has been reported for an unjustified delay and only one has been reported for an unjustified breach of the 21-day rule. Clearly, we hope to improve on both performances. More resources have been given to departments to uh, improve their uh, performance. And I note in the interim report uh, on the current session, the committee said, I quote, the overall percentage of errors in SIs has decreased. We're working hard to maintain progress. In, in the... um, I rise because it's been a privilege to have served on this committee for a number of years. Indeed, at various times I've chaired the committee and I was very much involved in the preparation of this particular report. Um, as, the, as the Minister said, scrutinising study instruments can feel sometimes rather remote, distant, uh, special technical thing to do. <coughs> but one must never lose the sight of the fact that a statutory instrument can seriously offend, influence or affect a, a person's rights on duties. Yeah, yeah. And therefore, yeah. the the importance of uh, a statutory instrument of this kind, and particularly the importance of its accessibility. In our, report, in our report, we make very specific recommendations to make sure that statutory instruments and the relevant documents are available and accessible to the individual citizen. If I could quote from the report in paragraph 49, <laughs> accessibility, accessibility uh, to legislation is an important part of the maintenance of the rule of law. And so I hope the Minister will particularly impress upon the departments of the significance and importance of making these instruments and relevant documents accessible to the citizen. Yeah. I, I agree with um, that section of the report that dealt with accessibility. Uh, with uh, the increasing availability of the internet, hopefully uh, statutory instruments are more accessible than they would otherwise have been when they were only available in uh, hard copy. Uh, we are in touch with the National Archives, who have responsibility for putting these SIs uh, online. And we have taken on board the one specific recommendation in the report about making sure that those who originally had access to a document that was subsequently changed had access to the change without having to make special efforts to, to find it. And I endorse the, 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 the words of the noble lord about the importability of SI, importance of SIs, which is why the JCSI and the Secondary Legislation Scrutiny Committees have a key role to play. We see too many skeleton bills. Uh, the Healthcare International Arrangements Bill is the latest example and one of the very worst. These bills force us to use secondary legislation scrutiny procedures 
for what should properly be in primary legislation and subject to amendment. And then there is the flood of Brexit SIs, many laid without proper impact assessments or consultations. We debate, but we cannot amend, and we are unwilling to reject. We have rejected, in fact, only seven SIs in the last half century. And this doesn't lend itself to effective scrutiny. Does the Minister agree that we need a thorough review, both of the use of skeleton bills and of our procedures for dealing with SIs? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, yeah. Well, the Noble Lord's question goes slightly broader than the uh, narrow question about statutory instruments, transparency and, and accountability. On the first point that he raised, it is a matter for the DRRC to draw attention to primary legislation where, in their view, too, ma too many powers are being uh, su subjected to uh, subordinate legislation. And as the House knows, the House can amend legislation as it goes through. And the Government has indeed amended legislation in many cases where the House has expressed the view that too much has been delegated. The particular bill that he refers to is being debated uh, later uh, today. Uh, on the other uh, the question about a, whole a wholesale review of statutory instruments, that goes slightly broader than this particular question, and at the end of the day it is a matter for the House rather than the Government whether they want to change the way in which they scrutinise legislation. My Lords, the, the, the Minister was present when I suggested uh, on Monday that it was something of a disgrace that it is 40 years 1979, since the House of Commons last rejected a statutory instrument. I, I wonder whether the Minister could be persuaded to ask the Post Office to issue a commemorative stamp for the future. <laughs> <laughs> that way we will either remember the process and revitalise it, or accept that it has been confined to the dustbin of history. <laughs> I'm grateful to the Noble Lord. I, I was present uh, in the House of Commons on that historic date, um, but I can't remember which side I was on because I, <laughs> I can't remember whether it was before the general election in '79 or afterwards. Uh, so far as the Noble Lord's suggestion of a commemorative stamp is concerned, I think that's a very good suggestion, but it might be subject to a statutory instrument. <laughs> My Lords, um, can I add my appreciation to the Joint Committee on the work they do? It's hugely valuable, particularly when we have so many statutory instruments coming forward. But the Noble Lord and the Committee both made, quite rightly, a lot about avoiding delay. Can I also make the plea on accuracy? Because one of the problems with SIs, understandably, is they can't be amended. And if in the government's haste to get so many through in such a short space of time they are not accurate, it is, as Lord Rowland said, it does have enormous consequences. So can I ask the Lord to consider, I don't know if he knows the answer to this, how many days is it between an SI being published in draft form before it is debated? Because that is the opportunity to pick up inaccuracies. And does he think sometimes they come through a little more quickly than would be anticipated to give proper effect to scrutiny prior to them being tabled? So far as affirmative resolutions are concerned, they can't come into effect until they've been debated in both houses. So far as the negative ones are concerned, uh, they should be laid in draft 10 days before they are made and then 21 days before they're coming into force. And the 10 days is to give the um, committee time to recommend that it should be changed from a negative to affirmative. In the 48 cases where they have made that recommendation, the government has uh, agreed. So far as errors are concerned, as I said uh, in response to an earlier question, the overall percentage of errors in SIs has decreased, and we're working hard to maintain progress. Baroness Thornton. My Lords, I beg leave to ask the question standing in my name on the order paper. My Lords, we recognise the huge contribution that general practice and the partnership model has made to patients over the lifetime of the NHS. We wish to thank Dr Watson for, this report, for the report of his independent review, and we are currently considering his recommendations. We are planning to publish a formal response in due course. I thank the noble lady for that uh, answer. Uh, the GP partnership review makes seven key recommendations, including an increase in the number of GPs and funding for those roles, an expansion of the range and capacity of healthcare professionals working with GPs, such as developing the role of practice nurses, and focusing on general practice in medical training and, indeed, recommendations to deal with an unsustainable workload. All laudable aims, my Lords. What is puzzling me is the context in which these aspirations can be delivered. 
78% of EU doctors working in the UK are not reassured by the Prime Minister's commitment to protect the rights of EU citizens. 35% of EU doctors are considering leaving the UK and moving to another country. The Tier 2 visa cap means that 1,500 applications for healthcare workers was rejected by the Home Office last year. And indeed, there are more GPs retiring, leaving or going part-time than are entering the profession. So my question to the noble lady is, is there a plan to remedy this existing shortfall and impending shortfall, which is already and will continue to threaten patient care and safety? Well, I thank the noble baroness uh, for her question. She is absolutely right that recruitment and retention of GPs is a core priority for the government. That's exactly why, in the long-term plan, increased funding for GPs was um, increasing at a rate higher than the rest of the NHS at £4.5 billion. It's also why we have a target to recruit 5,000 more GPs, and I'm pleased to report that, higher educa- hi- that HEE reported that we, increased the, we, that we recruited um, the highest number of GPs last year um, than ever before. Um, We also have some core um, recruitment schemes to um, increase GP retention. The GP retention scheme, the GP retention fund, the GP retention service and the releasing time for care programme, which is £30 million. We we accept that this is a challenging thing to achieve, however, and we are working hard to improve our performance on this. On the subject of GPs uh, retiring... What is the government going to do about the fact that many GPs are retiring once they reach age 55 because their final salary pension scheme exceeds the £1 million limit, which the government reduced uh, successively from £1.8 million, and then come back as locums, costing the health service even more? What is the government doing about that? Something which not only affects GPs, but a number of people elsewhere in the public sector who are behaving completely rationally because they suddenly find themselves being taxed at 55%. Well, I don't think I'm able to talk about other parts of the public sector. However, we do recognise that there are legitimate concerns here, and we are re- working with the BMA and NHSE as part of our work on recruitment and retention of GPs and consultants, and we are considering what mitigations, if any, would be appropriate. If this was in, indeed a, a good report and a welcome one, and the Royal College of General Practitioners welcomed the findings. But they noted that the profession was concerned about red tape surrounding appraisal, CQC inspections, and now GDPR, all getting in the way of patient care. So can the Minister tell the House who is responsible for squaring the circle between improving patient care and GP regulation and accountability? Mm-hmm. The noble lady is absolutely right that we want to free up GPs to do exactly what they have been trained to do, which is to care for patients. That is why, as part of the GP contract, um, we have included funding to ensure that they are um, able to claim funding for any additional costs that they may have under GDPR. But it's also why we put in the long-term plan that we want to recruit an extra 20,000 additional staff who can do the other can provide for the other services, um, such as administrative services, that GPs um, are sometimes caught up doing and they should not be doing. My Lords, um, the the list of things that the government is intending possibly sounds very impressive, (laughs) but I'd like to ask the noble uh, lady some very simple thing. Communication is particularly important to general practitioners who might see 90 or 100 patients with abdominal pain, one of whom may have a cancer of the colon. That's one of the major problems. Has the noble lady ever sat down and had informal conversations with general practitioners who are threatening or who are retiring early to actually understand how they feel about it? Well, I absolutely have had large numbers of conversations with general practitioners who have struggled not only in my previous role as a member of parliament visiting large numbers of general practices in my own constituency but I am of course also the daughter of a doctor and I have a rare disease so I spend a lot of time in the NHS as a patient and perhaps as a mystery shopper so I think I can assure the noble lord that I have quite extensive experience of the NHS. I would not claim however to understand what it is like to be a general practitioner and so I would always hope that I can learn by continued experience of listening to their experiences and challenges. to think that the reality that we see every day in the outside world 
differs completely from what she says at the dispatch box. Um, I don't think that that is the case, um, the Noble Lord says. I think that we are making good progress. It is a challenging picture for general practitioners. That is exactly why, since the new year, we have introduced the long-term plan to increase funding for the NHS and particularly to increase it for general practice. We have introduced um, this uh, particular review with the support from the department. We have introduced the, G G the new GP practice with support from the BMA. And we have also introduced the new GP IT futures plan so that we can bring in the most innovative technology for GPs so that they can bring the best and most innovative care to patients. Yeah. Basim of Brighton. My Lords, I beg leave to ask the question standing in my name on the order paper. My Lords, the continuing provision of free school meals to children from out of work or low income families is of the utmost importance to this government. Due to the generous transitional protections we put in place, no child that is eligible for and currently receives free school meals will lose their entitlement as a result of the, United, uh, the universal credit rollout. And even more children will benefit by retaining eligibility through the protections. <laughs> uh, my Lords, it's estimated that there are five million children now living in poverty in the UK. So isn't it time for the government to consider using the pause in the rollout of universal credit to reconsider its mean-spirited free school meals policy? My Lords, I ask what assessment has the government made of the number of families who are in, in work poverty who do not qualify for free school meals but for whom the cost of school meals causes genuine and daily hardship? Yeah, yeah. My Lords, I would dispute the Noble Lord's assertion about the number of children living in poverty. The DWP estimates that there are 300,000 fewer children in poverty than, than prior to 2010. In terms of, of the uh, eligibility for free school meals, the Noble Lord would also know that through the introduction of infant free school meals, another 1.5 million children are now in receipt of them. And I give credit to our coalition partners, the Liberal Democrats, and in particular my Noble Baroness Lady Garden, for helping bringing that in. But we are in a better place than we've ever been before. <laughs> to the fact that there were 300,000 fewer children in poverty now. Can he be truthful with the House and say that that is his assessment in relation to abject poverty rather than relative poverty? Because that makes a huge difference. And if he's only talking about people who are in destitution rather than poor, then it's misleading. Yeah, yeah, yeah. My Lords, the Government should be there to support people in the most vulnerable state, and that's why we use the, the, the statistics that the DWP use, and they produce annual estimates, and they say that the rates of material deprivation for children have never been lower at 11 per cent. Um, I wonder if the Government would consider rolling out the free school meals programme more widely in the next few months as we go through Brexit. Uh, all indications are that food prices will rise rather than go down. There are categories of children where their parents are in dire poverty who do not receive free school meals, and all parents living here under immigrant status do not get free school meals either. For families in poverty, it's a true lifeline. And would the government think about rolling it out at least across the summer term while some of this all settles down? My Lord, it might be worth pointing out this week's ONS statistics, which uh, show a rather more positive figure on employment. We now have 32.6 million people employed in the country. That's 167,000 more than July to September of 18, and 440,000 more than a year ago. We, are, we take child poverty very seriously, and we are always encouraging schools through the use of the pupil premium to encourage additional recruitment to the programme. Uh, not agree that there is general agreement that having a good diet improves your performance at school. Taking that on board, would not an education minister try and encourage his colleagues to make sure more people get free school meals, not less? Yeah. Yeah. My Lords, as I replied to an earlier question, the number of children in receipt of free school meals has increased over the last eight years. But I do agree with the Noble Lord that a nutritious diet is absolutely essential for young people, and that's why we've encouraged things such as breakfast clubs, and you'll be aware of things such as the sugar tax, which are all aimed at trying to create a healthier nutritional outlook. My Lords, my Lords, my Lords uh, the two-child limit means that welfare reforms weigh particularly strongly on families with three or more children. 
What assessment has the Government made of the consequences of changes to free school meals set to impact children with more than one sibling? And does the Noble Minister agree that this policy will effectively harm children from large families through no fault of their own? My Lords, we announced uh, the, the Home Secretary, uh, I beg your pardon, the, the Secretary of State for the DWGP announced some changes in the last few weeks, and we have, uh, we have included the issue of, of the two child limit to that. But if, uh, if you need more information, I'm very happy to write to the, to the right Reverend Crowley. My, my, my Lords, these, these meals include whole milk as opposed to that rubbishy skim stuff, <laughs> because if children are fed on whole milk, as 8,000 in Canada were, there is no obesity. I heartily agree with the noble lord, and indeed one of the extraordinary conundrums is if you go into a supermarket to buy milk, you pay just, just as much for the, that, that thin stuff on the, the red top as you do with full fat. My Lords, you seem to forget that children are the future of this country, and the Minister is, not, is hiding behind the whole statistics. I think we should look at giving free school meals to many more children than we are at present, and also looking at helping families for school meals at a much younger age, even when they're at nursery, because if they don't be fed properly now, they will not become full adults in a later stage. Yeah. My Lords, I can only come back to my earlier answers that we have dramatically increased the number of children who are benefiting from free school meals over the last eight years, and indeed we are now spending £600 million to ensure that infant free school meals are widely available, and that has a take-up of over 86 per cent. It's the idea where the statistic from Lord Basson comes from of five million people, young people living in poverty. <coughs> Unfortunately, I, I, I can't answer that question. I think that, uh, that the, certainly the, the Children's Society came up with a number which, again, was without true validity, and I think it doesn't help the debate on, on this issue. Lords, the delay in uh, rollout of, uh, is recognition, surely, by the government that inter alia it's not offered proper protection to around a million children in poverty who would have become eligible for free school meals under the transitional arrangements. Uh, but are expected to miss out at the cost of around £430 per child. And as the noble Lord Lord Addington said, teachers know only too well that an undernourished child is in no fit state to be taught effectively. The current Secretary of State for Work and Pensions shows, I have to say, signs of a caring approach that was singularly lacking in her predecessor. So will the Government now adopt the policy consistently advocated by Labour and support all children living in poverty by completing the rollout ma maintaining the existing rules uh, under which all universal credit claimants are eligible for free school meals? <laughs> My Lords, we did debate this matter about a year or so ago, almost exactly a year ago, I think, and the key thing which it may be misunderstood is that the, the provisions we put in place with, for children uh, with, from parents with, on universal credit is an extand, expanded cohort of children, so more children are now entitled to it than were before uni universal credit. Lord Orton of Liverpool. My Lords, I beg leave to ask the question standing in my name on the order paper. My Lords, to prosecute terrorists for treason risks giving their actions a political status or glamour they do not deserve, rather than treating them as merely as criminals. The Government has just passed the Counter-Terrorism and Border Security Act, which updates terrorism offences and introduces new powers to reflect the threat we face today from foreign terrorist fighters. This will provide the police and intelligence services with the powers they need to protect the public. My Lords, whilst no one would want to glamorise any of the crimes that we're talking about here, nevertheless, doesn't the noble Baroness agree with me that those who have justified the murder of other British citizens through the bombing of the Manchester Arena in 2017, for instance, and that those who have taken up arms or given succour to those who have targeted British forces and civilians have betrayed this country, its people, its values and its laws? Given the conflicting conclusions of the Law Commission reviews of 1977 and 2010. Isn't it time, my Lords, to provide a solid legal basis rather than the 1351 Act for prosecuting hundreds of returning jihadists, perhaps in line with the conclusions of the policy exchange paper of Professor Richard Eakins of the University of Oxford and others, and a foreword by the noble and learned Lord, Lord Judge, which I have sent to the noble Baroness the Minister. Wouldn't this, and the creation of a regional tribunal to prosecute for crimes of genocide, 
demonstrate our unerring and passionate belief in the rule of law and that those responsible for heinous crimes cannot expect to evade prosecution. Well, I totally agree with the Noble Lord that uh, anyone uh, committing the atrocities such as the Manchester attack, um, I, I was in Manchester at, at the time of the attack, should not escape justice. And I commend the policy exchange paper. I think the Noble Lord will, will um, agree that the Home Secretary um, has said that he will review um, uh, all laws that we have um, at our power. But if you look at the recent counter-terrorism uh, bill, which has now come, become an act, the Noble Lord will, will certainly agree, I'm sure, that the new powers available through that act might, uh, in the future, prevent some of the terrible things that we've seen re in recent months. And in terms of an, a regional tribunal, my Lords, I'm not sure how practicable that would be, given the situation in some parts of the region. Oh, Lord, so I, I, I share the view of the noble Lord Alton. Um, I don't believe this would glamorise the, the things that are being done by people which are so loathsome. And I think it is appropriate that actually as a nation we show how repugnant this is and how appalling that sort of behaviour is. And when I was a minister it was very difficult at times to actually pin uh, to get into court, actually, people who clearly should have been in our courts to be tried. And this seems to me a way it can be done. It seems very easy, well, easy, it seems to be something that can be done to update the treason law and, and show these people to be traitors, something that our nation really believes they are. Well, my Lords, um, I hope the Noble Lord will agree that the, the recent uh, legislation has certainly given more powers uh, to the courts to prosecute, um, and I was very pleased that the Noble Lord uh, supported that bill through its passage. But, of course, in terms of um, the Treason Act, I agree that the 1351 Act is rather an old act. Of course, it was rel relatively recently updated in 1861, uh, I think. Um, <laughs> But, but, of course, um, whether a prosecution is justified in individual case, cases will, in, in fact, be a matter for uh, the courts and whether that appropriate charge is treason. But I'm not dismissing it. And, of course, the Home Secretary has said that he is going to look at it, uh, review. Of course, we keep all laws uh, under review. Um, so uh, whether that comes, uh, whether that, that, that charge is, is brought will be a matter for the courts. My Lord, your, my Lord, of the uh, counter-terrorism and border security bill, which the noble, my noble friend referred to, my noble friend Lord Folks and I tabled an amendment to the, terror, to the Treason Act of 1351 to try and give the government uh, wider powers to deal with the very fast-moving challenges to our, securities that now, our security that now exists. Uh, in asking that the amendment were withdrawn, uh, which it was, uh, my noble friend said, and I quote, in the knowledge that there is ongoing work in the Home Office to examine whether there are further gaps in our law and in order to help us counter hostile state activity. Could my noble friend update the House on the progress of that work? Mm. <coughs> well, my noble friend is absolutely right to, to, bring, um, to, to, to bring that up because, of course, we have to constantly keep our laws under review in order to keep up with um, some of the very fast-moving methods in which terrorists will uh, seek to destroy the unity of this country. So laws are kept under review, and um, I mean, noble lords have talked about an espionage bill, talked about a treason uh, bill. I certainly think the CT bill uh, that, that my noble friend took part in was, was, um, was very significant in terms of up updating some of our laws. My lords, yesterday, the minister implied that it was difficult to prosecute those involved with ISIS as effectively we had no extradition arrangements with Syria. That is why the government had to deprive uh, people of their British citizenship. My Lord, many of these people want to return to the UK, but the government is preventing them from returning to face justice by depriving them of their citizenship. Is the government strategy confused, or is it just me? <laughs> well, I think it might actually be the noble lord, because... Um... <laughs> 
It is difficult to, 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 to prosecute people in Syria. We have no consular access in Syria. People have been prosecuted when they come back to this country. Um, and In fact, people have been both prosecuted and put into um, programmes such as Channel to try and rehabilitate them. There are a number of different remedies available to the Government and to the Home Secretary in order to try and bring people to justice. My Lord, isn't the uh, use of the term a fast-moving home office the ultimate oxymoron? <laughs> I, d I don't think so, my Lord.